Hey everyone, thanks for stopping in to watch this premiere. I just wanted to give you a quick health update. Um, it appears that my lung is getting better and better. So the pneumonia that I had is starting to go away. And uh, it's been a little bit hard to breathe and you know, I've been dehydrated and everything else. But it looks like I am on the road to recovery. Still plan on getting a lot of rest. I want to thank the entire community including Steve Rice, most importantly Steve Rice, and uh, Rick G. and Silver Heist for putting the word out to everyone in the community, letting them know that I was under the weather. And I just want to let everyone know that uh, I'm definitely on the road to recovery. And I appreciate all the support. This is an awesome community. So let's all sit back and watch this premiere. Hey, Silver Steeler here, everyone. At my LCS, his new shop, a former Radio Shack. And we're about ready to meet Kurt Plowman. And there he is. And he's Hello, agreed everyone. to sit down with us. We're going to ask him some questions here. So, Kurt, is there anything you would like to tell us about yourself? I apologize, I'm a bit of a character. <laughs> <laughs> that you are. You have easily drawn me into the coin collecting um, business, I mean, or hobby. That's, uh, I just love it, and you're an inspiration to me. I uh, thank you so much for well, it. Thank you. I, I'm not sure how much of an inspiration I am, but I'm glad to have you as a friend as well. So. Well, I mean, let's face it, you are a coin collector, and you're all about the stories. And sometimes that's, uh, that's as much fun about it as collecting the coins themselves. I love a coin with a story, right. and you do it so well. Well, the difference between someone who is collecting bullion or, or buying something just for investment and a numismatist is that passion for coin collecting, the passion for the history behind the coins. You know, and especially United States coins and currency have a story behind every single piece. There is a meaning to everything that is on every piece of coinage that we have. And it's a great way for people who are not necessarily history buffs or not necessarily scholars, but are definitely people of intellect that want to get into something that's more than just a way of storing wealth, but also something that has a history behind it. And it's a great way for people to connect because you can look back at the history of the coin and say, hey, I can relate to that. I can understand why they did that. And now I can appreciate it. And it's stored for all of time in something that's not only beautiful, but functional. So that's part of the reason why I'm so passionate about coin collecting is because it's it's a great combination. And of course, who doesn't love having something that they find that turns out to be really valuable or really unique and it might be the only one they ever have. And lots of people have some similar and you can compare them and talk about them and it creates a community, a sense of belonging beyond just buying and selling a coin or just sticking something in a vault and never looking at it for 30 years. It's a living hobby. Right. Well, I know one other time we were... Uh with you and we did some shooting and filming and you had talked about the whole like the Marshall's coin mm -hmm. that had drawn in that somebody might receive that down the road have no idea what it stands for but they're gonna hold on to it because of the value of the metal right and then hopefully they'll do research on it and that's the whole tangible part of all of it is that they it gets them to do research well, again, like I said, it's not just beautiful for, for eye candy. I mean, every single United States coin has a certain aspect that is attractive to it. And even if you're not a penny collector or a dollar collector or a nickel collector, maybe you're a half dollar guy, you appreciate the beauty that's in all numismatica. And when you look down at a coin, even someone who's never held a rare coin in their hands can look at a coin and say, there's something special about that. And then that gets them interested. And like you just hit the nail on the head, many of us will be outlived by the coin. The <laughs> coin itself will last longer than we will. Right. And our history that's being made today is being recorded on the next generation's numism numismatica, the next generation's coinage, hopefully. Um, and so those stories will carry on whether or not we do or not because they are something that's collectible and there's value to it beyond just the art of the coin. It is, like you said, many of them have precious metals in them. And because they're made out of something that lasts longer than paper or an electronic device, coinage is a way to pass down our history and our stories so I apologize oh that's all right um, well how did you get started in coin collecting my grandfather um, he was a uh, kind of a, a codger like myself and had a lot of unusual hobbies and coin collecting was one of them he was a very amateur coin collector but he specifically liked Lincoln since 
Uh, specifically, he used to work for a factory, and when he wasn't working for the factory, he would go out and walk around the outside and collect aluminum cans and recycle them. And every time he would go and recycle them, he would have them pay them in pennies if he could. And then he'd go through the pennies and find the rare ones and fill his books up. And then what he had left over, he would either use it to spend or buy other stuff with. He funded his hobby with another hobby. Huh. So, you know, picking up other people's discarded materials, their, their trash and their, you know, their, their leftover soda cans or whatever, um, would allow him to then afford to have this little side hobby that didn't cost him anything out of his pocketbook but was a lot of fun. Well, I went with him on the scavenger hunts, as we called them, and we never knew what else we were going to find. But my favorite part was always when we would get the pennies and then go back and we would either do it at the park and eat something like an ice cream and we might play a game of chess. He was a great chess player. Um, he was also an inventor. He later on, he worked for, uh, uh, the factory he worked for was actually National Lock Corporation. Uh, and uh, they engineered uh, locking mechanisms for many things and he held patents for car door locks. My grandfather was, an act was actually an engineer for them. And uh, so he would explain things to me. And he's using pennies as a teaching tool, he would explain to me the history of the coinage. And so if we found an unusual one, he would tell me what was unusual about it. And to me, that was a combination of not just getting to learn about the coin, but spending time with a guy who was, you know, uh, interesting to me as a young person. And also, you know, he was my dad's dad, so he was family. You, you respected your elders. And, and he, to spend that time with me as a youngster was very invaluable. So it impressed upon me that coin collecting... I mean, it made it a part of my history, and I just carried it on from there. And, of course, I fell in love with a lot of different coinage. But, I mean, as you know, and some of your viewers may have seen this, that uh, I'm, I'm a penny guy and a Morgan Silver Dollar guy. Those right. are my two favorite American coinages right. of all. So I always thought that was interesting because you like the lowest denomination, and then you like the highest denomination as far as business strikes go. Yes, yes. So, I mean, it's right just that, that seemed like you just the middle stuff, eh, you, care, you like it, but yeah, you like the low one and you like the high one. Yeah. And and you know me, I'm, I'm I'm liking pennies. I think a little bit more due to you, <laughs> due to you. I apologize for no, having that's infected okay. you with I my, mean, my joy of pennies. No, well, I mean, you, you, of you, sense you, technically. Yeah, <laughs> we got we got to we got to be careful. Penny, pennies are a, an off nickname too. We'll we'll get into that someday about right. penny, pennies and cents. There's a difference. Right, there. and yeah. I know some in the community have some issues with. One or the other. Oh, too, very much so. so. And I don't know if your camera can see it, but the, you know, you'll find their uh, rollers that that mm -hmm. actually have the word pennies on them. That actually they, they print the word penny right on there, and uh, then others will say cent. So you know, it, uh, it it's kind of um, I'm not sure. I don't think that one says pennies. I don't know if I have any of them out here that have cents on them, but they're they're technically a, there isn't a, such a thing as a penny. It's a, they're all United States one cent. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, it's kind of cool. A penny is a carryover from before the scent was popularized or, or monetized. Right. Well, listen, uh, are, are you a stacker? Well, I don't know that I would classify myself just as a stacker because although I do collect silver and I do store silver mm -hmm. and use it as an investment tool, um, I classify people who are primarily stackers as individuals who are doing so mostly for the intrinsic value or the silver value of the item, not right. the numismatic value. I'm probably heavily weighted a little more heavily toward the collector side. Um, in other words, if I have a common silver round, just a piece or a silver bar like this, um, this item I would save and store for... Uh, you know, for the uh, monetary value of the item. To me, this isn't quite as, as beautiful. And I would be willing to let this go. This item I would sell for investment purposes. Whereas if I were to say, for example, American Silver Eagle, I'm not going to sell it just because the silver value goes up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so if to, to answer that's a loaded question, yes, I do stack silver. Yes, I do have, you know, uh, silver in my safe that I do keep. Uh, on deposit and it is an investment and I do add to my collection as time goes on and periodically I sell some and wait for the market to drop back down and then rebuy it so that I increase my holdings. So in that aspect I do practice stacking Right. but I would classify myself more of a, a collector than a stacker primarily because I love the beauty of the coins more and if I have to spend, if somebody said to me today Kurt you can spend this amount of money whatever it is, let's say a hundred dollar bill on your favorite item would, would I buy silver or would I buy Numismatica? I'm probably going to be more likely to spend it on a silver American Eagle than I am on buying a silver bar, only because I appreciate the beauty of the silver coinage more than I do the silver, the, the, you know, the, right. the bulk bullion silver. Now, with that being said, it's circumstantial. So if there's a situation where 
I'm faced with paying more than the normal premium to buy that American Silver Eagle right. versus paying the same price or you know the silver price for silver bullion, I'd be more likely in that situation to for the stacker side of me to come out and say, well, wait a minute, for the value, I'll go ahead and buy the silver bars today, or I'll buy the you know the, if people walk in the door here all the time with stuff that I would never go out and find, but I will very happily buy because it is a good investment and because it is something that I can buy and sell and make a profit on. So that's the part of the stacker part of me. And I know you didn't ask this, but I think that's part of what also makes a good coin dealer is someone who's willing to embrace both sides without condemning or, uh, one or the one other. Or the other. If well, you do both, you make everybody happy. And I think you know this about me. I got into it for numismatics. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, as I saw the price of silver just plummet, mm -hmm. I decided to start stacking some. Mm -hmm. And now that the price has gone back up higher again, I've gone back to numismatics. Right. Only because I don't think numismatics jump around as much with the fluctuation of spot. That is correct. If you compare that to a, a you know, for example, something like a 1921 Morgan dollar, uh, the value of the 1921 Morgan dollar is only slightly affected by the value of the silver. This no. coin is worth more than uh, its silver value alone. The silver value on this being around thirteen dollars today, right. uh, the coin itself is worth far more than thirteen dollars already. In in order for it to be affected greatly by the silver value, this coin would have to uh, the silver value. Uh, spot price on silver would have to skyrocket. You right. know, if silver were to hit $35 an ounce, then obviously there's a possibility that its silver value may eclipse its coinage value because this is, of course, a common silver Morgan dollar. Now, mm -hmm. if you were to take uh, a more rare, let's say a Carson City, that, you know, a Carson City silver dollar contains 90% silver. It's not a pure one ounce silver coin. With that being said, if it has $13 in silver today, with silver being a little over $18, so if you do the math, a Carson City silver dollar, or even a common one worth a few hundred dollars on the open market, it silver would have to skyrocket to mathematically what, uh, $325 <laughs> an ounce? Right. So, which would then make it more like a gold commodity. Right. And then it would eclipse the value of the numismatica. So, what you just said a moment ago, when silver skyrockets, numismatica becomes a better investment because it's more stable. Right. Now, on the other side of that, because you've been stacking, some people would argue that you should liquidate some of your silver and either buy numismatica or hold on to the cash until silver dips again, if you think it'll dip. Now that's... And a lot in the community talk about the silver to gold ratio. Yes. They want to see that slip down so they can convert their silver into gold. I mean, what was it, at 93 one time this year? Mm -hmm. And recently slipped all the way back, almost down below 80. It was at 80 point something. Yeah, I don't know yeah. what's happened now that silver and gold have both they're, they're, dived a little bit. Yeah, they, 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 this last two weeks has been up and down quite a bit uh, between the two. You know, gold, gold has been just as volatile as silver. You know, the, the warning uh, that I have for anybody who's thinking about getting into investments is you have to have patience, but you also have to be willing to act. So you've got to find a balance in between there. And I'm not a... I'm not a, 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 a financial, financial advisor, advisor. <laughs> of any kind, <laughs> right. um, but uh, I, you know, I can tell you what my preferences are. I can tell you how I handle the market and what I think is right. Well, listen, why don't I skip a couple questions here only because I don't want, um, I, um, have you ever been to any U.S. mints? Yes. Which ones? Yes. Uh, I've actually been to most of the current operating mints. Um, I, we, my wife and I like to travel quite a bit. Uh, and we've uh, had the opportunity to stop by uh, most of the U.S. mints. Um, I've also been to the Department of Treasury. I've been to the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. So um, I didn't... So have you been to Philly? You've been yes. to Denver? You've yes. been to San Francisco? Yes. yes. Have you been to any of the been, defunct I've been, ones? I've been to the memorial site for the New Orleans mint. Okay. Uh, I have been to West Point. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. Uh, we went there, actually. I had a relative and then who what was, leaves... Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. Oh. I had a relative who was graduating from West Point, so we decided to, you know, go and see it. Uh, I've been outside Fort Knox, uh, okay. you know, the gold repository. And a lot of people know that, you know, West Point, of course, is a silver repository, so uh, it's pretty cool. It's a, it's a mint and a repository. Mm -hmm. Kind of a they got some gold there, too, though, don't they? They do. They, they do. do. Yeah. But That's far better. more silver. Yes. Right. Yes. How about Carson City? That's one I've not been to. Ah. I have not been to Carson City. Um, that's on our list, winning image, and that's, we'd like to hit the Carson City one. Supposedly, they've got coin shops right across the street from it. They do. They do. There are, there are advertisements there all the time. Oh, I, yeah. I get all the flyers and, and uh, 
newsletters and suggestions for those places. Now, when I've been to the, I don't know if you go to the Florida Numismatic Show, the fun show in Florida. No, I haven't, but I definitely hear a lot about it. Well, there's actually a gentleman who has, I believe, one of the stores that's located directly catty corner from that mint, and he always brings a really great selection of Carson City items. He, he has a phenomenal amount of product available, not only for sale, but he has a whole display of items that he won't sell. He has his he has a VAM collection of nice. Morgan dollars, of course, including uh, all of the rare, harder to find uh, Carson cities. He's got uh, a really awesome registry set, which isn't for sale, but he will let you hold it. Nice. So it's it's pretty cool. And he always goes to the fun show. I, I can't remember what, what booth he was at when I saw him last. But. All right, here's another one. Do you like, what do you like better? Do you like gold or silver? That's an easy question. Um, honestly, I'm more of a silver guy. Here's okay. the reasons why. To me, silver is the everyday person's collectible and investment precious metal. It's also, in my opinion, more likely to be something that will be tradable should something happen to the financial market. I believe that although gold has a lot of purpose and a lot of value, it is not near as flexible a material as silver is when it comes to trading. So for example, not only because of the price disparity, but the usefulness. Um, yeah, used in the industry. Yes. Silver, and medicine. Yes. Silver has a tremendous amount of applications that are used for a great many things. All right. Also, most people equate silver to be more valuable than it is when it's transformed. So let me give you an example. Um, a gold necklace um, weighing, you know, say 30 grams has that much value in it. The average person, when they would hold that 30 gram necklace, would not be aware of the relative value of that, you know, being approximately an ounce of gold that it has today, you know, $1,200, $1,300 worth of gold in it. Right. Um, now, with that being said, that same weight in silver is an ounce of silver at $18. All right. So you're looking at, a, as you point out earlier, 80 to 90 times ratio in right. value difference. Now, the trade-off to that is, is that everyone knows gold is valuable, so they're, they'd be very happy to spend you know, 1200 bucks to buy $1,200 worth of gold in a necklace. However, when you make a necklace into silver, the same necklace having $17 or $18 worth of value in it, we, you'll actually notice that most people will pay way more than its value. So um, if, I, if you want me to, I can, show the, I can show you visual examples of these two things. Sure. Um, so I'll step away for just a second while okay. I grab a couple examples from the showcase. All right. So forgive me, I stepped away for a moment to grab these examples. So um, here we have a, uh, a fairly nice example, uh, Figaro style chain. Um, this one happens to be 14 karat gold. Okay, and uh, I'm going to try to put this in front so everybody can see on the other camera here. So we'll turn this on. So it weighs right at 3 grams. Uh, I'm using grams because most people are comfortable with grams rather than penny weights. Sure. So that weighs about three grams. Okay. This one weighs about six and a half grams. This one is actually silver. Um, it's gold layered silver, but it's actually a silver necklace. So the example here is, is that if you were to do the math, these two items, this is twice as heavy as this neck as the gold necklace. The silver one's twice as heavy. And yet its retail price is about fifteen dollars. Okay. It has, as you saw, six grams, a little over six grams worth of silver in it. This one, obviously, uh, today's market value, you're talking, what, uh, what can be the math here? Get my calculator out. Uh, so 28.3 grams for an ounce. Yeah. And this one was, I'm sorry, right at three grams. So, and I usually do this by penny weights in the store just because... The, most of the people in the neighborhood or the other shops are using penny weights and I don't want our customers to be confused. So <clears throat> this has a melt value of $84.73. And so, and the trade-off on this one is, uh, we'll pull up the silver value on this one. Sorry, I'm not quite as fast with this on grams. I usually do anyway. So this has three dollars and fifty cents worth of silver in it, with a retail value of fifteen bucks. Comparatively, if you go around any any of the jewelry stores or places around like Walmart or Kmart, it's going to be fifteen dollars or more at a place like that. So you've got an item that's worth you know five times, or it's selling for five times its value. 
So if I looked at you and said that if this is at $80 and uh, you do the math, you know, 80 times five, you would never pay me, you know, uh, 16, 32. You wouldn't pay me $370 for that necklace, would you? No. No. So silver, more versatile, believe it or not, the common public are willing to pay a greater premium for things made out of silver than they are things made out of gold. So if you look at that from purely a collector's standpoint, uh, when it comes to the, the, the scrap value of items, gold is a much more risky proposition because when you go in a situation where we all as stackers believe that there's a possibility of occurring when paper money is valueless. Yeah, you, currency you, reset. Yeah, so this is going to be very hard. Gold is going to be very hard to trade for its value alone. How many loaves of bread are you willing to give me for this necklace? You know, versus how many loaves of bread for this one? The reality is, is that in the, in that event, this is probably actually going to be harder to sell and trade for its value than this will be, than the silver will be. The other thing is, is that there's far more silver in small denominations. Um, sure. I mean, we always have bags around of uh, gram, one gram trade pieces. These are all assayed one gram pieces. That fractional are, silver. They're fractional silver. Right. They're, they are, a lot of people nickname them ap apocalypse silver. Right. Because it's what you're going to carry around in your pocket because you're not going to be carrying around, like most of us, most coin people, or, you know, collectors, right. we always have a handful of pennies, dimes, and nickels, and quarters, right, and <laughs> lint. But... <laughs> If that, if that money goes away, if the government-backed currency should ever go away, it's going to be fractionals you're going to carry around. And you're going to be far more likely to have a handful of silver fractional than you are a handful of gold fractional. So if you ask, this star all started by asking me the question, am I more of a fan of, of silver versus gold? That's, that's number one reason why. The second reason why is because I have a lot more ability to influence young collectors into collecting silver than you do gold. Primarily because of the cost of the item. Sure. You know, it's easy to have an extra 20 bucks laying around to buy a silver coin than it is. It's much more easier for a young person, you know. Especially a young person. Yeah. Somebody who's mowing lawns and delivering papers and that All kind right. of stuff. You know, I, now I'm showing my age because they don't hardly deliver papers anymore unless you have a car. <laughs> but whatever the case may be, whatever side jobs they're doing to make that cash before they become old enough to get a regular job, those are the collectors of the future. Those are the mm -hmm. people who are going to inherit our collections and our love of coins. Right. they're not going to probably be infected with collecting as easily with gold as they would with silver because it's also not likely that they're going to go into their local coin store and somebody's going to hand them a piece of gold. Well, when it's very common, when I do events here and we do you know special things or we do a, a show for someone or we do a, 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 a community involvement where I will give away silver. You right. know, recently during the, uh, the, the nationwide scavenger hunt, you know, we gave away 250 pieces of silver throughout the community, randomly hiding them uh, and placing them in unusual places. The people at Walmart loved me because I was sticking them between cheese packets. Uh, you know, literally just giving away silver with our address on right. their little sticker with our address and telling them And that them was a cool thing, just trying to inspire, you know, more people out there to yeah. get into the hobby. Yes. Um, what coin, what is your favorite coin in your collection? Probably would have to be my very first 1909 SVDB uh, wheat cent. There yeah. we go. Yeah, yeah. There so. we go. And uh, since, you know, I'll just add another one in there. What about, what's your favorite Morgan that you got in your collection? Honestly, my favorite Morgan is not a very popular or expensive one. It's not even one that has much numismatic value anymore, but it was a gift from my daughter. Uh -huh. I carry it around with me everywhere I go. So um, now she, she gave me the coin. I put it into a bezel to carry it around with me. And uh, it's, you know, just a, a little old common, 1802, you know, from the New Orleans Mint. 1902? Uh, eight, 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 no, 1892. 1892? I, I 1892, Morgan Dollar. It's heavily worn. It was heavily worn when she gave it to me. Pocket coin. Yes. And uh, I, I, my, the daughter who gave this to me is unfortunately no longer with us. Uh -huh. uh, she went home. Uh, but uh, so, so I carry this with me everywhere. it's got a ton of sentimental value to Yes. It. So that's my favorite uh, Morgan. It it's, has nothing to do I, with numismatica. And has no, very little, no, but I certainly <laughs> understand why it would be your yeah. favorite one. Now, if you had to ask me what my favorite piece of coinage that isn't that would be, I'd probably have to say um, I really love the Carson City Morgan dollars, and I have a couple in my collection that are absolutely, in my opinion, gorgeous examples that when I look at the coin, I get excited just holding it in my hand and playing right. with it. So. Well, we'll have to, uh, one day we'll see this. Sure, perhaps. absolutely. I'll bring up my collection. Um, 
How about this? Which coin do you wish you had? Well, um, hard to narrow down to one, but if you could, oh, I'd love, I would love uh, an official piece of Confederate gold that was struck, you know, uh, in in contradiction of the United States Treasury, only because I love the history and the numismatica behind it. Uh, and if anybody is familiar with, you know, Confederate gold, uh, very, very, very few pieces are known to exist, and the ones that do are extremely highly sought after, and they're gorgeous. Right. Uh, either that, or I wouldn't mind. Um, I'd love to have a, a first strike of a Goldbrecht dollar. Um, you know, that would be great. And, and of course, I'd want that certified and, you know, All right. uh, and, you of know course. And, and encapsulated. But, uh, you know, and that brings me to another point is, is that encapsulation is something that you should only do for coins that you are protecting from any kind of other further deterioration. Encapsulating coins, in my opinion, and this is a whole conversation we can have someday, this is just my opinion, that it should be done to preserve the coin and that should be the sole purpose of doing it. If you encapsulate coins to increase or enhance its value, that's another form of speculation and I don't say you shouldn't do it, but I don't recommend it because right. it takes so long to recoup that money that you put into right. the coin. Well, I mean, we've talked about my Morgan Dollar collection mm -hmm. and how on the date run, I'm missing the 1893 and 1895. Mm -hmm. And how at one point it might be good if I can't get them off you or look for them elsewhere that it might be good to get that graded if I had to, just so that I mean, those are some for two artist years. Sure, and there's a you always want to ensure when you're buying a coin that th th both of those are going to be multiple hundred dollar coins. Yes, it's, I mean, I think uh, a ninety two in in AG is what two one hundred and five dollars right now. Right. One hundred and five dollars in about good. Right. And no, not many of us really want an about good in our our collection. Sure. Well, we'll take one. You want to bring me one in? I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> But the reality is that we'd all prefer to have coins that are in much better condition. Well, and I so leave off the table the 1895 Philly proof because that's just right. That's, that's unobtainable for yeah. I mean, <laughs> really. Um, we know you like U.S. coins. Uh -huh. Who is your favorite U.S. designer? Hmm, probably Morgan. All right. Yeah, I would say Morgan. There I, you go. I like a lot of Barbara's. There's design. only one too, wasn't it? As far as business strike coins, that was this it. Is the only one. Well, yeah, he he only designed the one business strike. Now he was influential, of course, in a uh, lot of other designers. In the peace dollar, too. Yes, he was. Yeah. He had, uh, you know, like we got a series going on where we're finding out he had a lot to do with the yes. peace dollar. He, he had to. He influenced a lot of other designers and right? engravers throughout his history. You know, good one. I I, I like that one. Oh, it's um, not Adolf A. Wyman, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, who's your favorite president? Uh, so, I'm probably not going to be very popular about this one, but I, I really love the, the 76 releases um, of the uh, uh, GSA coinage, so I, you know that, that's going to you know, throw you for a loop there. A lot of people are not a big fan of Nixon, but it's not has nothing to do with his politics. I don't like him as a politician. Right. I just like I like some of the things that happened during his administration. I got now, you. if you want to ask me on a political standpoint, I I don't like to talk politics. But sure, and we're not asking you to. Yeah, I I think the the biggest thing for me is is that I'm a fan of any president that can rally our country, and I think that John F. Kennedy did an amazing job of doing that. I think, however, my absolute favorite president probably would have been Lincoln, but it has nothing to do with coinage. All right. This is a man who took our country during a very tumultuous time frame. Mm -hmm. He managed our country through a civil war. Many of the things that he did during that time are controversial. Many of the decisions that he had to make and the circumstances that uh, occurred during his presidency were started many, many years before his presidency. Mm -hmm. But he had to deal with the situation, and he was right. the face. Oh, he in he inherited a mess. He did, and and. To, you know, it, like any other politician, he had to do some things to make the masses love him that were not necessarily who he really was. A politician cannot win solely on their ability to be a great leader. Mm -hmm. They also have to be a great orator. And in most cases, especially in the time frame when our early presidents were around, you didn't have social media. You literally just had direct word of mouth. It was person to person. Right. You didn't log on to a, a mass media such as we're using right here to share information. Right. You know, you couldn't watch the president uh, from one side of the country to the other simultaneously. It, it took days, weeks, or years for that information to pass on. So for this person to rally our country to the point of being able to defend itself and its, its, its belief system, um, to hold together uh, the northern colonies, or northern states, I should say, 
uh, and, and lead our armies through a time frame when our country was struggling financially, spiritually, economically, health-wise. There was nothing really going great at the United States time frame. And the few positives that were going on during that time were so far overshadowed by the beginning, ensuing, and completion of the Civil War that for anyone, in my opinion, to look back and look at what Lincoln did and not revere him for all the things he did, you know, he was a very in, in influential person when it comes to a leader. And, and this is a person who was, like myself, multi-talented and did a lot of different things. Didn't just have one thing that he enjoyed doing. I mean, this, is, this man was uh, a, a logsmith. Uh, mm -hmm. he, you know, he, he was a lawyer. He was a statesman. He worked as a shopkeep. I mean, you probably ask yourself this question like I have, so. What if the man never got assassinated? Oh my! I mean, yeah. could you could you imagine? I mean, he he'd well, be a shoe in for re-election. I mean, and wasn't he serving his second term when he, or he was he was at the yes when he was assassinated. You're talking about yeah yeah. Um, but at the very beginning, right? right at the very, the very beginning. beginning or end of it, he had already won the election. Was at the end of his second end of his end first of his term, first term, right? Yeah. So yeah. he would have had at another the four theater. years to go. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and if you take that into account, if you look at the other greatnesses that occurred, I mentioned John F. Kennedy, mm -hmm. those two, if you look at the similarities between the two of them's lifestyles, the two of them's histories, and the way the two of them were assassinated, they were both assassinated by controversial individuals. They were both assassinated in public settings. They were both publicly mourned by everyone. Yep. They were very well-beloved presidents. And, uh, you know, for those people who like conspiracy and, theories... And wasn't it nice at that time, too, that it didn't matter whether he had an R or a D behind the name? I mean, no. they the people loved him for being the president of the United States. Correct. That's correct. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's something you just don't find in today's environment anymore. No, no. So, listen, one last question. Sure. And uh, we know you have many other hobbies and interests. Care to elaborate on any of them? Well, um, I do like to play the game Magic the Gathering. Uh, many of you who have been in my store know that. Um, the other side of our business, of course, is a, a gaming shop. Um, the, my other hobbies include uh, I love going to auctions. Uh, my wife and I are avid auction goers. We like to travel. Uh, specifically, we like to drive places. We like to go on the trip somewhere. Um, my wife and I do fly to go to, on long trips, but usually we like to drive if we can. Oh, we love um, driving. Yeah. Me and I. That's... Yes, absolutely. The, the sights, the scenery, the conversation. You miss too much through the air. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely. a big country, and you don't really get the size of it yeah. until you've gone from coast to coast like we did one absolutely. year. It took well, five weeks to go we all do the things, way around. Yeah. And we do, my wife and I, when we go, we always do experiences. So we love cave diving. Um, oh. We love uh, you know digging for gemstones. We've been to several gem sites throughout the country. Uh, we've been, been to Canada. And dug for gems up there. Nice. And it's uh, it's something that we really. My my wife and I want to go on another trip. Our our favorite is Diamond Hill Mine. Uh, it's a family run little business. It's gorgeous. Um, nice little area of on site camping, uh, not too far from uh, uh, some local a couple of local towns that have good eateries and it's a nice little atmosphere. It's very relaxing. And you go and you dig for crystals and it's twenty bucks a day, and you carry out all you want. Hand tools only, no machinery allowed. <laughs> uh, so it's a lot of fun. But yeah, as far as hobbies, everyday hobbies, I enjoy playing Magic the Gathering, coin collecting, and going to auctions probably would be the top three. Nice. So. Well, listen, like I've told my audience out there before, we plan on doing um, a few segments with you. We'll eventually get into denominations. And, and here's a preview <laughs> of what our next one will be. Yeah. So thank you so much, Kurt, allowing us to do this with you. And we'll be, uh, we'll be back on the next one, everyone. All right, my friends. Like I said, we're going to do several different segments with him. The next one is going to be on 9-11, about 9-11 gold and silver. Remember to like, subscribe, and all those other good things. I'll see you on the next video.